at one of the smaller books of the Bible. You know it as Obadiah, right? Correctly pronounced Ovaja. Ovaja is a composite word. Uh, the first part of Ovad is the same as Eved, meaning servant. And Yah stands for Yahweh, uh, one of the ways to pronounce the Tetragrammaton. So, Ovadja is known as a servant of the Lord. And this book, interestingly enough, is very short. It's the shortest book in the Tanakh. really deals with something that you might think is not that relevant to you now, but I believe it's going to be more and more relevant as the days go by. It's really having to do with enemies. I know you didn't come here today to learn about enemies. People don't come to services to learn about negative stuff. But you know, this is the Bible, and the Bible has all kinds of teachings for all of us. It's not all about, as I said last week, fun and games. So in this um, letter, or this book, O Vajja, uh, there are three general, generally and very important subjects. Uh, battery looks like it's on the fritz. So why don't we let it go, uh, Rashad, as long as it goes, and then be prepared. Okay. Uh, so I think it's going. <laughs> we have batteries, but I can speak very, very loud. Although the people who are listening to the <coughs> video might not be too loud. Unfortunately. Okay. So uh, let's continue. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me, Bob, back there? Okay, good. I'll do my best. Um, the three uh, subjects here in this, uh, in this book uh, of Avaja are, number one, uh, how to identify our enemies. You might not think that's that critical, but in our day and age, it's becoming even more and more critical. The second section, verses 17 and 18, deals with uh, a prediction of deliverance for the people of Israel, or the, actually it's stated as Mount Zion, representing the people of Israel. And the third section, verses 19 through 21, speaks of judgment and punishment that, be that belongs to God. God is the one who is responsible for judgment and punishment. It's his domain, not ours. So oddly enough, people don't know who Ovadja was. There are 13 Ovadjas in the scripture. So which one was this? Which Ovadja was this one? I am going to say that I believe that the Ovadja that's being uh, recorded here uh, was the one that spoke around the Babylonian captivity and shortly thereafter. Does anybody know the date of the Babylonian captivity? What is the Babylonian captivity, huh? Well, our nation, the, the southern nation of Judah, uh, was not following God's direction. And God, being a loving God, decided to discipline our people. And you know, a father disciplines his children, right? Otherwise, there's not demonstration of much love. Previously, the northern kingdom, called Israel, had already been taken captive by the Assyrians. So, this is five or six hundred years after, uh, or a little longer after Moses led the people into Israel, people had forgotten and were beginning to fall away from God. So, the Ovadja being spoken of in this letter, I believe, was the man who was actively prophesying in the days of the Babylonian captivity and shortly thereafter. One thing I found out about Ovadja, he was a fearlessly faithful follower of Yahweh, a fearlessly faithful follower of the Lord, and a passionate hater of Edom, or Edom. Edom is the, is the name of the people that came from Esau. Remember Esau, right? In the days of the patriarchs, 
Jacob and Esau, brothers, born from Rebekah, our matriarch, were always locked in battle from literally day one. And Esau hated Jacob because Esau gave away his birthright and his blessing and then resented Jacob for seeing that it was worth having. This is me again. Esau gave away his birthright and his blessing and then he hated Jacob for taking the birthright and the blessing. This is the Middle East today. The same message is going forth in the Middle East today. Whatever happened to the patriarchs, the tradition says, happens to the people of Israel to this day. So, uh, I want to start looking at this. About, let's talk about enemies for a second. What are enemies? Do you have any enemies in your life? We're not, uh, that's rhetorical. We're not going to discuss your enemies today. Rhetorical. Can you think of an enemy that you've had? Maybe in the past, maybe when you're a little kid, or maybe in business, or maybe in your work, you might have an enemy. Sometimes enemies come from different denominations, and they fight and fight, so you end up with thousands of different denominations in the world. Uh, in, in Christianity, there's hundreds and hundreds of denominations, even now as we speak. In Judaism, there are three major branches, Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform, Reconstructionist, you're out of reform, and now there's more, uh, there's another uh, group which is more like liberal, um, more modern. So in Judaism, there are less breaks, but there's less people. Seems like the more people you have, the more potential conflict you have and the more enemies you can have. But enemies are the people that misjudge us, gossip about us, hurt us. You know what that's like. I've experienced that. I've had a lot of enemies in my life, even though I never meant to have enemies. It happens. It's just the way life is. But you know who the real enemy is? Of all divisions is Hasatan. The adversary, his role in life is to cause division. And he's done a pretty good job, don't you think? He causes division in religious groups, in congregations, in marriages. He loves that. He, he's victorious if he can cause division. So, uh, we want to take a look at just a brief history of the message that Ovadia is going to give to the people of Israel. These are called um, um, prophecies or oracles is another way to describe them. This all begins, uh, as I mentioned last week, and I'm just summarizing quickly. Uh, in verse 1, uh, it, we read that God told Avadja, Arise and let us, and let us rise up against her for battle. Us here is not Avadja, the Israelites, and God. Us means the nations in that area. It wasn't just Israel fighting the fight. Israel enlisted the support of many nations to fight against the Edomites. They were nasty people, nasty people. Um, the, uh, the church father named Origen, I know you don't know those people who were in the third century, wrote of the Edomite people that they didn't have, they had no longer had a language, a name, or a history. In other words, when God prophesied that the people would come against Edom, it really happened. It really happened. God's word comes to pass. We must remember that. So there's a series of oracles uh, given against Edom. I'm going to summarize them real quickly for you. The first one had to do with Edom's pride and arrogance. It says in verse 3, The pride of your heart has deceived you. You, say, you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? The Edomites had become proud. Here's what happened. The Edomites were delegated and relegated to living in the south part of Israel, uh, down towards the Dead Sea, in the mountains. You can't farm in the mountains. What do you have in the mountains? You have billy goats. You have 
animals that you can't raise. You don't have cattle. It's a very rugged and difficult life. But the Edomites didn't understand that was a judgment of God to place them there. The, Edomite, the Edomites thought, oh, we're up high. Nobody can defeat us. We're, in, we're impenetrable. The fact is they did not recognize that God could penetrate. So the Edomites never waited on God. They never looked to see any from God. They just believed that because of their situation, they were just blessed. But they weren't blessed. Their pride did not recognize what had happened. Their God was themselves. Their God was their nation. Their God was their fierce might. Well, it's called pride. Their God, was, their God was not God, their God was themselves. Self-deification or pride. Do you ever get proud? Do you ever get to a place where you cannot admit your own mistakes? That's called pride. It's not a good thing because pride goes before a fall. But God is not mocked by the Edomites. He brings down the arrogant and one day, and, and that's exactly what happened. The Edomites no longer exist. Their pride ended their lives. The second oracle uh, I'm reviewing was the uh, oracle that uh, uh, predicted plunder and destruction on Edom uh, for participating in their attack on Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 6 says the Edomites will be ransacked and no hidden treasure will remain undiscovered by the conqueror. Here they were proud. They were proud of their riches. They were proud of their position. But God said it's not going to last because you, Edom, have hurt my people. That was the judgment. Even the group of people that they had gathered together to do battle was going to fall apart. All the men of your confederacy will force you to the border. The men of peace will, will, with you will, shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. This is an oracle against Edom that they are going to fail. Even though they feel confident and cocky, they are ultimately going to fail because their God was themselves not the God of Israel. I think the spirit of Edom is alive and well today. I think the spirit of Edom lives in Iraq and other places that are ridiculously attacking Israel for no good reason. This is not to say that Israel's perfect, but Israel is the chosen people of God, living in the chosen land that God gave them. You can't argue with God. This is God's decision, and yet there are people who are continually attacking this fact. And I know that the world will not be at peace until people recognize that this is a decision that God made in centuries past to give that little land of Israel, it's a small, now it's small, but initially it was large, to the people who are descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oracle number three. He accuses the Edomites of losing their wisdom and understanding. They had in their group of, in, in Edom some very wise people who actually worked with magic and soothsaying and that sort of thing. But even them were not able to help because they were not telling the leaders of Edom how to behave towards Israel. They did not do their job, the wise men, and give good counsel to the leaders of Edom because Edom continually attacked the Jewish people. So, the, so God, through Ovaja, makes another oracle that Edom is going to be punished because the leaders did not follow the truth of God. And the fourth oracle, or prophecy, if you will, against Edom, um, was that your violence was due, your violence against your brother Jacob is why you're being punished. Now think about this for a second. When did that take place? The violence against Jacob, we're now about 525 BC, uh, uh, BCE, where this, is being, this prophecy is being given. When did the violence against Edom take place with Jacob? A thousand years before, when Esau attacked his brother Jacob. Do you know that Esau was willing to kill his brother? 
It's called fratricide, fratricide. And Esau would have been happy to kill his brother Jacob. He was so jealous of, ja of, e of Jacob because Jacob ended up with all the goodies that Esau rejected because Esau was stupid. And Jacob was smart enough to follow God and see that God had a plan of blessing. So Jacob got the blessing and the birthright while Esau had a bowl of porridge. It says in Scripture, he, had a, he got his own little bowl of food. He was, he was focusing on the inner self, that is the stomach, rather than the spiritual self. But Jacob was wise. Esau hated him for that. The Edomites hated Israel because they saw the hand of God helping Israel and they didn't want that to happen. In fact, the shame of Edom, it says in verse 10, is they stood on the other side. What does that mean? When Israel was being taken captive to Babylon, we moved from the Holy Land to Babylon, Edom stood by and clapped. They stood on the other side. God wants people to care about his chosen people. That's in the Bible. It's his plan. Those people who stand on the side and clap or don't support Israel to this day will be judged, I, I assure you, because God will not be mocked. He chose the Jewish people as his chosen people. Deal with it. A lot of people don't want to deal with it. They negate the truth of Scripture because of that. And it's going to be, there'll be a price to pay. Edom stood on the other side and they gloated while the Babylonians took the children of Israel out of the land of Israel. They gloated. So there will be a judgment day for them. Verse 15 and 16 begin to focus on that. The prophecy said, as you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. What Edom did to Israel, the prophecy is saying, is going to happen to them. You know the expression, what goes around comes around? You've heard that expression, what goes around comes around? That's not in the Bible. But the principle is, what you sow, you will reap. If you serve God and follow Him, you'll get blessings. If you don't, you will be cursed. Edom was going to be cursed. And verse 16 says, For as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. The, the scriptural message in that is that you will be gobbled up by the nations around you, Edom. They will drink, drink of you. It's a, it's a poetic way of saying you're finished. <clears throat> Ovadia's word of judgment for Edom, because of what she had done, she was given the cup of God's wrath. It's a poetic expression, to drink and to swallow. The prophecy that she would be as though she had never been came true in subsequent years. Now these verses, these oracles, should stir us up a little bit. We should remember that any one of us could be acting prideful or angry or unrighteous or not helpful, right? Guess what? We will have to give an account for all that. We are called to be something special, especially as Messianic Jews and Gentiles. God has a special calling on our lives. Are we living up to the calling? We need to ask ourselves, are we living up to the calling on our lives? I guarantee if you look closely, you'll be like me and find out you're not. And we need to recognize that and make the needed changes. Remember, as the Lord said, as you have done, Edom, it shall be done unto you. Just keep in mind, what goes around comes around, what you sow, you shall reap. Now I want to say there's a parallel here between what happened between Israel and Edom and the life of a believer. If we look at what God did with Israel as similar to what Yeshua did on the execution stake at Calvary, and we look at the work of Edom similar to, to the work of Hasatan, Satan, we're going to see a very interesting parallel here. 
There was about 500 years between what happened in Edom and, and Israel and Yeshua's execution on the cross of Calvary. But there's something similar that I want us to take a look at. The first deliverance was when God delivered his people from the Edomites. They were, they were going to wipe out the Israelites if they could, but God delivered them. God delivered them. God even delivered our ancestors from the Babylonian captivity and brought them back to the land. God is a God of redemption. Am I right? God gives second chances. Israel blew it badly, and they had to be taken out of the land, yet God restored them and returned them to the land. This is the nature of our God. He wants us to have blessings, and yes, from time to time, we'll, we'll not be in the, we won't feel we're in the land of blessing, but we have to remember that we're just about to arrive at the blessings that God has for us. Verse 17 says, uh, and there will be holiness. There'll be holiness, meaning that when this prophecy comes to pass, God's going to restore the holy temple. The temple had been destroyed in the Babylonian captivity, and this verse 17 tells us God's going to restore the temple. That was very important, because the temple was a central place of worship for the Israelites. The temple still is no longer there. The Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, is a retaining wall remaining from the destruction of the temple under King Herod, the Roman, um, the Roman leader of that day. So the temple no longer exists, but I have news for you. A third temple is going to be rebuilt. And I think I can hear the building now. They are making ready to build the third temple in Israel. Did you know that some there's a group that is actually gathering the elements to build the third temple? Can you imagine what this is going to be like? Can you imagine how politically incorrect that will seem to the entire Arab world? Because guess where that temple is going to be? In the same location the previous temple was, but there happens to be something called the Dome of the Rock sitting on top of the Temple Mount. This is, this is the beginning of the end times. The, when, when the temple, when God takes away the Dome of the Rock, which I think will happen supernaturally, I think, and the rebuilding of the temple can begin, it's, it means the end is near. And I think we're coming closer to that. So the fact that the temple was allowed to be rebuilt was a great blessing to the people of Israel. So let me just uh, make a little connection here. I don't like to do over-spiritualizing. I don't like to say, here, this historical event, it really means this. It's not this, this meant something then, and now it means something now. It means that both things are true. So let me read this little piece written by an um, expositor, a great expositor of a, of a previous generation. He wrote, prophecies which were susceptible of historical and, appro and approximate fulfillment in the restoration of the Jews from Babylon have a higher and broader and more real accomplishment in the great deliverance and outward manifestation um, of Messiah's sacrifice. He's saying, even though what happened to Israel was very important, the greater redemption, I think we'll all agree with this, is what Messiah did on the execution stake. By allowing himself to be executed, and you know he didn't have to do that, he could have called down many angels to take him off of the cross, the execution stake. Um, he fulfilled the, the, what happened in Edom and Israel in ancient days. So this man says, um, uh, I make no apology for taking them, that is the history, and applying it to the life of Yeshua the Messiah. So I think that's fair to do. I think what we saw happening with Israel and Edom, we see happening with Yeshua and Hasatan. The comparison of the post-exilic deliverance on Mount Zion, that's after the exile, the Babylonian captivity is called the exile because the Jews were exiled from the land. That's called the exile. So the Babylonian captivity is the exile. So post-exile Israel is after the Jews came back. That's called the post-exilic period. 
And this description leads to a, a very important point of the exile that comes through Yeshua's shed blood. When he came as the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the suffering servant, sin was judged and permanently paid for. He suffered in humankind's place for the primal sin of humanity, which was pride. What happened in the Garden of Eden, which allowed sin to come into this world, was based on the pride of Adam and Eve. They didn't need God. They could eat whatever tree they wanted. That's what they said to themselves. Friends, when we get prideful, when we say, well, we can work around what God says, that's pride. Who are we to do that? God makes the rules. God sets us in motion. If we would only follow his ways, he would pour out blessings upon us instead of curses. The choice, my friends, is ours. Messiah suffered in humankind's place for the primal sin expressed in the Garden of Eden and seen among the Edomites. The solution to the problem, though, is something called faith, something called trust. If we have trust in God, if we have faith in God, we will have this free gift of deliverance. But it cannot be earned. It is a free gift. Do you trust that God has given his free gift to you? That you've accepted this free gift? You have to accept the free gift. It's like I had a birthday recently and my daughters gave me a gift. It was free. But I had to accept it and start incorporating it into my life to receive the benefit of the gift. Just like faith. We have a, uh, when God enables us to see the truth of Yeshua, that's a gift. Not everybody has the gift of faith. I assume all of you do or you wouldn't be here on a Shabbat morning with a Messianic Jewish rabbi. But we have to appropriate this. We have to receive this free gift of faith. So I want to pull on a few more points before I have to close. Um, the holiness mentioned in the post-exilic deliverance was primarily the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, in the Holy Temple. The restoration of the Holy Temple is what is being referred to when Israel is going to come back in holiness. And then they went back to Jerusalem and rebuilt the Temple. The evil one is delighted, friends, when we make enemies of everybody that we know. He doesn't want people to get along. He wants people to have nothing but fights and battles and arguments. He's happy when there's division. Take my word for it. If there's division in your life or within congregations or between congregations or in countries or, God forbid, between political opponents, it makes the evil one really happy. I watched the debates here last week. They were not that exciting. But I just thought it was so weird at how, how irrelevant most of the conversations were. Not dealing with the issues, but dealing with hyperbole, exaggerations. The evil one loves that. Does he want to see the United States of America become a perfect union again? No, he would like to see division in our country and division in Israel as well. We can only have unity and, and uh, uh, oneness if we confront the evil one with his divisive tendencies. That's why in Matthew 5, Yeshua said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be like the sons of heaven. In other words, the message is that if we're going to be true followers of Yeshua, we have to learn to love our enemies. How does that sound for a fun thing to do? Think of the people that you know don't like you. 
I know you're wonderful people. I know that. But maybe somebody doesn't like you. Or maybe when you were a kid, somebody didn't like you. It's time to forgive all that. Like we learned about from Rabbi Foreman's disciple, Manasha was that bridge that, that brought um, Reuben and God together so they would stand with the rest of the people when they went across the Jordan to take the land. We need to learn how to love our, our, our enemies. Love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be the sons of the highest. For he is kind, listen, he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. The message is, learn to be forgiving. Learn to be loving. Learn to be not like the Edomites, but learn to be the way Israel was always meant to be. And then we will have great blessing. Yeshua said, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with. In other words, uh, I have a job to do. And how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Yeshua wanted to see peace on the earth. He was called Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace, right? But here he's saying, I have to bring a fire first. The fire is to purge out the evil in the world. The message then to us is what God did in ancient Israel with the Edomites we should pray happens in our world today. We can pray for the destruction of the evil people. We can pray first that they turn to the Lord. Anti-Semitism, which you all know about, is happening again. I don't know if you're aware of that. It was only, what, 60, 70 years ago when Adolf Hitler turned all of Germany against the chosen people. Think about that. Through his rhetoric, his speeches, his anti-Semitic attitudes based on false, into, uh, false uh, based partly on false understanding of the writings of Martin Luther, caused the German people to turn against their neighbors, their fellow citizens, and turn the Jews over to the Nazis for destruction. There are people in this world today who would like to see that happen again. If we follow the message of Messiah, we can combat anti-Semitism. We can combat his anti-Israeli attitudes. Israel means well. They moved into the land that was a swamp and made it into a garden. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful place to be. And I want to, if you want to go on a tour with me, talk to me after services. I'll fill you in. Israel overcome, overcame the obstacles moving into that land. Likewise, we, with God's help, can overcome the obstacles put forth by our enemies, like Iraq, like Antifa, like some of the other groups that are so anti-American these days. And we can learn to do something very different. We can learn to love our enemies. Please say amen. And now stand, please, for Elena as we end our service. Lainer le shabbat, Adon Hakol.